And good morning. Good morning. How, we, how are we this morning? Wonderful. Good, very good. I guess the weather has been putting us in this some sort of mood, right? And now we have some April showers, which bring May flowers, bugs, yes, things. Things that we haven't seen in probably four to five months, right? Some good, some okay. Actually, some necessary, right? Some bugs are necessary, so that's a good thing. I'm done. Right. Very true. I love that. That's why you Some announcements that are on the back of the bulletin. I uh, just want to point out there is a trustees meeting. Uh, they will meet next week after uh, the service. Today is National Pet Day. Remember to hug your pet if you have one. And for you music lovers, today is also National Barbershop or Tent Day. Hug a tenor if you know one. I'm a tenor. <laughs> I was a baritone. Baritone. <laughs> I could be a tenor. <laughs> Things have a way of working out. Never underestimate the power of prayer, faith, love, and above all, never underestimate the power of God to see you through. Amen. Any other announcements this morning for our congregation? We had a wonderful Easter celebration here, and as we continue our Easter season, let us begin with our call to worship. Please join me. When Jesus appeared, he said, peace be with you. Let us take hold of his peace today and share it with each other. Our opening hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God, number 133 in the Red Hymn. Generous God, we thank you for your presence with us in our lives. As we gather this morning, we are reminded of the 
that many times we have doubted and feared. Today, banish our fears with the memory of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Remind us again that through all our troubles, doubts, and fears, your power, mercy, and love are with us. In Jesus' name, we always pray. Amen. <coughs> Risen Christ, our eternal Savior, like the disciples, we have gathered together the week after Easter, wondering whether it is true, marveling at the possibility, daring to hope. Like the disciples, we sometimes are afraid, sometimes full of doubt. But in your extravagant generosity, your boundless love, you appear to us in our fear and love us in our doubts and grant us the oceans of your peace. Thank you for loving us as we are. Teach us not to hide from our doubt, but to recognize it as a door to mystery and to deeper faith. After all, the disciples' fear became a visitation as they saw you among them, risen and triumphant. Thomas' doubt became a moment of revelation as he saw and touched you, and finally believed. Grant us the courage to live as witnesses to your resurrection. Risen Christ, be light in our world. Loving Christ, it is in your presence that removes all fear and erases all doubts. So come and grant the doubting Thomases in our midst your presence and your peace. And grant all of us, living Lord, renewed faith, great courage, and boundless peace. Be with us in this time of silence this morning. Prayers that are on our Easter hearts. Proclaim your saving deeds to all the world. Let us now pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us all so well. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We light our chalice this morning. Lord, with you. We light this chalice, symbol of the light within us and around us. May this gathering for worship enlighten our hearts, our minds, and our souls. And may the inner light of the Spirit be kindled by our time together.
Our biblical text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19, 19 through 31. And I'd like to ask Carol McCall to come up and read for us today. Thank you, Carol. last verse is quite uh, compelling. And I, uh, every time I hear that verse or someone reads it out loud, it just, it's, uh, it becomes emotional. And I think that's important and okay, right? It's cool. It's, it's the God feeling. So this morning I want to talk about handling a scandal. Mmm. I know you all showed up today because you heard it was maybe scandalous. <laughs> okay. Good morning. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It seems as though we might live in an age of scandals. Ooh, right? Sometimes it seems like every other day we are confronted maybe on the TV or in other media or other places we might find a public scandal. In the United States, our public conversation often is filled with celebrity gossip about who is going to do, who is going to be with who or who's coming out of rehab or who, which celebrity is with this celebrity. And so on. If that weren't enough to hear the stories about our, some of our elected officials and their private affairs, which also lead to the conversations of more scandal, and if the rush of real life politic and celebrity scandals is not enough for us, many of us turn to the dramas on TV, the soaps, tune into the sitcom television 
for even more scandalous fictional drama. These realities leave me asking some questions. So what is our fascination with the scandals? I have no drama, but I like to hear about other people's drama. <laughs> what is our fascination with the shocking or immoral things that people have done or believed they have done? Personally, I have come to believe that our collective fascination with scandals has to do with how entertaining it is for us to watch when the dirt of someone else's life is uncovered. Fair or not, this is the world that we live in, right? Fair or not. And most of us, if not, we're guilty, honestly. I mean, I am, right? Given this reality, you'd think we would be more people of conversation about teaching people how to handle scandals in their lives. Be great or small, in particular, you'd think that Christians and most people of faith would be most invested in helping people deal with and move past the dark, scandalous days of their lives. But unfortunately, too often this is not the case. Sadly, some of our communities of faith often like to pretend as though no one among us has ever had to deal with damage control situations in their lives. We may like to give the appearance that our communities are made up of perfect people. I'll say that again. That is laughing. Perfect people, right? Who live scandal free and undamaged lives. However, my friends, if we're honest, our communities are actually filled with people who have dealt with the difficult situations and have threatened their very livelihood, redemption, dignity, and respect. Whether it is the scandal of a divorce or a tax or an invasion, a home foreclosure, bankruptcy, employment, termination, an unwed pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, or just a general doubt or fear in our lives, most of us will face the situations in our private and public lives that require us to handle our scandal, right? In the good news of Jesus, in the Gospel of John, he provides us some concerning, but most precious ways on how we might go about handling a scandal, or our scandals. In the Gospel of John we read today, in chapter 20, we enter the narrative on the day after Jesus' crucifixion. And there is a scandal developing in the text that, we, that will require some damage control. We were told that Mary and Mary Magdalene, two followers of Jesus, visit the tomb of Jesus and find, much to their surprise, that there is no body in the tomb. This sets the stage for a scandal in the text because these followers assume that the Lord's body has been stolen. Initially, for these followers, the empty tomb wasn't a sign of resurrection. It was a sign of conspiracy. As it turns out, still to this day, those cynics and conspiracy theorists who say that the resurrection must have been a hoax, they say... Truly, Jesus' body was taken in the night by his followers. And the Gospels are nothing more than a literary cover-up. Well, friends, I say lovingly in response, I'm so glad that the story doesn't end with the empty tomb. In reality, it comes with a God who shows us how to deal with life's scandals and emerge victorious. 
In verses 11 through 17, while the woman cry at the empty tomb, we realize that Jesus is, in fact, not dead. He is risen. According to the text, Jesus appears in the tomb and tells his followers that he's alive and waiting his ascension to be with his heavenly Father. In this powerful act of appearance, Jesus begins to address the looming scandal of the empty tomb and to deal with the damage of his crucifixion. And what I love about this is that it shows us how to deal with some of our own messiness in our own lives. Consider this truth. In the midst of the scandal of the res excuse me, of the crucifixion and the empty tomb, Jesus doesn't hide. He reveals himself, makes himself known to those who love him. You know, I understand that when we, I, you, are going through our personal struggles and scandals, the temptation is to alienate ourselves and to try to hide from our doubts and our fears and our troubles. During this time, we find ourselves only wanting to be with the selfishness of ourselves, me, myself, and I, but... Though it may be beneficial during life's scandalous times to retreat for a season, at some point the season of retreat must end and we must do as Jesus did. We must make ourselves visible. Indeed, we must make ourselves known and find the courage to open up to those who love us the most. For as long as we stay hidden, hear me, as long as we stay isolated, we give power to the enemy within. But when we find ourselves to move from the darkness to the light, we free ourselves to be examples of God's gracious restoration and redemption. We open ourselves to the possibility of our test becoming a testimony and our own scandal becoming a salvation story. Maybe you have something relatable. Yes, but friends, Jesus chose to make himself visible. And in doing so, he gave hope to the seemingless, seemingly hopeless followers. And he set in motion the beginnings of a movement that would give the whole entire world eternal hope. But Jesus doesn't stop in making himself known. He continues to handle the scandal of the crucifixion in the empty tomb by engaging in the powerful act, telling his own story. In verses 19 through 23, Jesus appears to his disciples and shows them the wounds of his hands. In this act of vulnerability, Jesus allows his followers to find hope by sharing his story pain resurrection. Undoubtedly, there were many stories being told about Jesus' death. I'm sure there was the story of the disciples who foolishly gave up so much to follow a man who died like such a failure. I'm sure there was also the story that Jesus didn't have the power and intimacy that God Claimed, or else he would have died the way that he died. I'm sure there also was the story that Jesus was no better than any other unsuccessful, self-confessed Jewish Messiah. And I'm sure there was the story that the dead body of Jesus had been carried away, never to be seen again by those who loved him. Oh, but the beauty of the story is that Jesus overshadows all of these stories with the simple act of telling his own story. By showing the wounds of his body, he told the story that he had experienced the pain and the death. But yet he stood as a testament that the death was not his last 
were. He stood as a testament that death had been swallowed up in God's victory. It is in our redemption story, like Jesus' story, that the power is to inspire if we choose to let it. Perhaps more powerful than the songs we sing, the scriptures we quote, or the sermons we preach, and the story we tell about God's transformative work in our lives. That's the true story of Jesus. Sometimes we try to bury or conceal the struggles and scandals in our lives because we are afraid of how others will view us. We create uh, cover-ups to hide our mess-ups, not realizing that God can show up when we mess up. What's worse is oftentimes our refusal to tell our own story opens the door for others to tell their stories for us. This can be dangerous. A wise person once said, remember the gossip committee is always more interested in spreading the story than telling it right. However, when you tell your own story, joy and pain, sunshine and rain, we create the opportunities for us to become wounded healers. So if you have a story of pain and divine perseverance, make up your mind to tell it. If you survive something that you thought would take you out, tell it. If you've gone to hell and have water, but you're still standing, tell it. If you got not on your back, but God gave you a comeback, tell it. If you survived a scandal and outlived the rumors, tell it, because there's glory to be found in your story. And finally, in verses 21 through 23, Jesus tells his disciples, as the Father you sent me, I am sending you. In other words, after making himself visible, telling his own story, Jesus takes the last step in handling the scandal of the empty tomb and starts to write a brand new chapter. At this point, the scandal has been handled and the mess has been addressed you like I did that? The disciples have been empowered and given peace. Peace be with you. And the loved ones have been com comforted. And the resurrection has been verified. Now there's nothing left to do but to start a new chapter by moving on with the work that God has ordained. So he tells his disciples, in effect, I did my job, now it's time to do yours. One of the biggest mistakes we can make in our lives is to make a temporary dwelling place, a long-term abiding place. No season of scandal or personal struggle should last forever. At some point, we've got to decide to turn the page or write a new chapter in your life. This reminds me about a writer that I was talking to once. He told me that one of the most difficult things about writing a book is dealing with those tough chapters. He said sometimes he'd spend days on one chapter and wouldn't seem to come together, wouldn't seem to come together. So I asked him, well, what do you do when this happens? How do you overcome it? He said, simply, I just start a new chapter. So my friends, if we're going to overcome the dark days in our lives to live, if we're going to go through and handle the scandals that come into life, if we're ever going to do what God has given us to do, we too will have to do as Jesus did. 
We'll have to make ourselves visible, tell our stories, and then start a new chapter. <coughs> Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, God of all life, goodness, peace, joy, and love, we are so thankful that you love us and cover us even in the difficult times in our lives. You enable us to find the glory in some of our scandalous stories. And for that, we are thankful. And so, O oh Lord, we pray for your continually abiding love to encourage us and to nourish us and to push us along when in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our second hymn this morning, number 209 in the red hymnal, Be Still My Soul, The Lord is on Thy Side. giving this morning <coughs> what a blessing it is to give and to receive and to share in the support of this church the love and justice and equality inspire our acts of service and compassion we dedicate these gifts to all that we stand for as a community of faith in God Amen <laughs>
Heavenly, most gracious Father, bless our hearts today. Bless our scandals, and thank you for letting us know how to handle our scandals in life. Let us be the life that has given in Jesus' name. Let us be that everlasting love that you share with each and every one of us. We pray this always in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn, number 223. Let your story be Jesus' story, and peace be with you this day and every day. Amen. Our congregational hymn this morning. Carol? 79 in the Red Book. Thank you. Fairest Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. 